a lyre was a, a little bit like a guitar, but it, uh, it's closer to a lute, but it didn't, it, it's shaped differently. It's shaped like this. You have, a, you have the uh, sounding board, the box here, you have an arch here, and then you have usually seven or eight strings. One, two, three, four, so five. It's like a harp with a guitar. It's, it's, it's a, like a harp, but it sounds like a soft guitar. Uh, so, but right, or it's like a lute. It plays like a harp. It plays like a harp. You pluck it, yeah. pluck the strings. Symbols are signaling, you know, they signal the yeah. beginning of song and so on. Yeah. Um, now, uh, a, uh, that's the lyre, that's the most important instrument, like that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay? Uh, and that plays the melody. The harmony is given by the harp then, which is a bigger instrument and it's deeper, yeah. um, and so on. So was, was the, the box configuration, was that hollow or was that... Small? This is a hollow... Uh, Sorry, this is a sounding. This is the sounding board. This magnifies the sound. Okay, and you have the strings. Then up here, you tune the strings according to the uh, pitch, right pitch. Now, I'd like to touch on the liturgical role of the kings. Um, God confirms his covenant with David um, and his successors because of Solomon's obedience in a, a uh, building the temple and implementing the divine service. So uh, uh, God promised that if David's son was faithful to him then the house of David would be established. Uh, and Solomon was faithful in establishing the divine service. Now, uh, Dylan, it's back to you. Can you look at those two passages? First Chronicles 28, 6 to 7. First Chronicles 28, 6 to 7. All right. And he said to me, Solomon, thy son, he shall build my house and my courts, for I have chosen him to be my son, and I will be his father. Moreover, I will establish his kingdom forever, if he be constant to do my commandments and my judgments, as at this day. So if Solomon keeps on faithful to God, then God will establish his kingship. His descendants will always be God's kings. Um, or 21 Second Chronicles 21 verse 7. Could you read that too, please, Dylan? Second Chronicles 21 verse 7. This puts it much more simply. Second Chronicles 21 verse 7. Verse 7. Verse 7. <clears throat> How be it, the Lord would not destroy the house of David because of the covenant that he had made with David as, and he promised to give a light to him and to his sons forever. God promised to David that he would give a light or a lamp to him and his descendants forever. Uh, that his line will continue forever before him. Um, now, Solomon's status and all the successors of Solomon were adopted sons of God. So they were in uh, a charge of the house of God, the temple, God was the father who lived in the house and the status of Solomon was as of the son, the firstborn son of God. So the king is the adopted son of God. Very important for New Testament theology. Jesus is the light of the world, the first one, but he's also the Christ, the Messiah. He's the son of God the father. And as the son of God the father, he is in charge of God's house. Right? Next, um, God delegates his kingship over Israel to Solomon and his successors. There's a number of very startling expressions there. Um, uh, could you read both of those, please, Levi? First Chronicles chapter 28, verse 5, and then Second Chronicles 13, verse 8. 28, verse 5. 
all my sons, the Lord has given me many. He has chosen my son Solomon to sit on the throne of the kingdom of the Lord over Israel. Now notice the funny expression. He's, this, uh, the, he's to sit on the throne of the kingdom of the Lord over Israel. That means the throne belongs to God. And he sits on the throne together with God. You can see this sometimes in uh, pictures in the ancient world. You get a picture of a throne. It's a very broad throne. A throne is a seat. And uh, you have the king seated on the throne. And guess who sits on his right hand side together with him? Well, not, we don't have a, a, a Solomon. This is just kings. Is his right hand man, his heir, his co, his son. So they, actually so, sit on the same they sit on the same throne. And by the way, this is where you get uh, where you get that phrase in the creed: Jesus ascended into heaven and does what? He sits on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. Now the picture is God reigning as king. Jesus sits on the throne together with God. Whose throne does he sit on? The Father's throne. And if he sits on the right hand side, what does that mean? Right, that's, it's grace. And it's it's, it's, it's grace. All that stuff, he reigns together with God the Father. So, God, God calls Solomon as king to sit on the throne together with him. In other words, he reigns here on earth together with God. Get the picture? Footstool, that's another part of it because then at the bottom here you had a footstool and in the ancient world you had pictures of the enemies of the king depicted on the footstool. Yeah. Right? So that's, that's symbolism. If you're interested in some of this stuff, get hold of one of the most remarkable books that I know is by Othma Kael K -E -E -L, called The Symbolism of the Biblical World. It particularly focuses on the Psalms. Tony, did you have your hand? Oh, no. Oh. Garth, yes? Sure. Yes? Uh, um, with, so that's all the kings sit on the throne with God or just Solomon? Solomon and his successors. Okay. And that's in looking forward to the time. That's what they were supposed to do. But what happened? Instead of ruling faithfully together with God, they try to do it by themselves, they disobey God until the greater David comes, the greater Solomon, who's Jesus, who takes over and does what the kings fail to do. So the, the left hand and the right hand is very specific, isn't it? The left hand is judgment, bad luck. If you get left hand treatment, it means the king used that hand to, so, yeah. to reject. Right hand. Yeah, the chopping block. The right hand is the, uh, the good side, the lucky side, the favour. So anybody who is at my right hand side is, uh, is under my favour. And you approach somebody, if you want something from them, guess from which side? The right hand side. Um, in a court of law, who stands on your right hand side? Lawyer. Which lawyer? You. Your lawyer, the one who defends you, your advocate, who stands on your left hand side? Your accuser, your prosecutor. Yeah, but it doesn't, that doesn't work on the throne. Because no. The king's on the left hand and the right hand. No, 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 here. Okay. Uh, there's a difference. But this is, uh, this is, with, this is, uh, in, this is in a royal court. Yeah. But a court of law is a different thing. Because you stand then in front of the judge, and the person who's at your right hand side is the person who defends you. The person on your left hand side is the person who accuses you, prosecutes you. Okay? Different picture. Yep. Next passage, Garth, uh, chapter 13. Is it Garth? Yes. Is it turn? No, no, yeah, Levi. 13. Second Chronicles 13, verse 8, please. And now you plan to resist the kingdom of the Lord, which is in the hands of David's descendants. You are indeed a vast army, and have with you the golden calf that Jeroboam made to be your gods. 
Okay, notice the kingdom, God's kingship, is within the hand of David and his successors. God delegates his kingship to David and his successors. They rule together with God. They rule in the place of God. They rule as God's regents. Um, okay, now, what's the responsibility of a king is not primarily political or economic, but religious. To do God's work in, the, in connection with worship. So the king has responsibility for the endowment of the public sacrifices. Who pays for all the animals and all the stuff that's needed to keep the services going? The king does. Um, secondly, the king organizes the priests so that the priests do the work properly. So he is the one who has general oversight of the priesthood. He's not a priest but he is responsible for their organization. He's responsible for the maintenance of the temple. If the temple needs to be extended, repaired, um, uh, something needs to be fixed up, the king finances it. The king makes sure it's done. Thirdly, fourthly, very importantly, if there is worship of other gods or the wrong worship of God in the land, the king is responsible for rooting out idolatry and wrong worship of God. But most importantly, if the Israelites go the wrong way and, and don't worship God the way they should, it's the responsibility of the king to reform worship. You remember the great reformers? Josiah, Josiah Hezekiah, and we get a whole list of other ones too in uh, uh, Second Chronicles. So the res it's the responsibility of the king to reform worship. Yes? Sorry, I might have missed something, but we were talking before about how in second, first second yes. don't have a king anymore, so who's doing all this for the priests? Okay, now once, I'll come to that in a minute. Okay. Um, once there is, well let's deal with it now. Once there is no longer any king, yeah. we go to Ezra and Nehemiah, uh, you see, there's a big problem then. Who takes over from the king? There's two groups of people. There's the high priest who takes over this responsibility. The high priest takes over that. And who takes this responsibility from here downwards? Who takes responsibility to make provision for the stuff that's required in worship? The people. The people. So, the, in, in effect, the people take over from the king um, in their responsibilities for the temple. A it's a kind of democracy, yes. A religious democracy, not a political democracy, a religious democracy, yes. Do they get certain months, like the tribe of Judah was there on this particular month and they have to live the food? Yes, there's certain rosters that were then established to make sure that this was done regularly. And, and does that set the term? Sorry. The same for Christianity. That's right, because out of that you get the offerings that we receive every Sunday. Who pays for the pastor's salary? Who pays for the upkeep of the church? The people do. We don't have a king. The government doesn't pay for this. We pay for it. It's our responsibility. Now, um, even though David's not a priest, the kings and David together are with... Uh, no, uh, even though David's not a priest, um, the kings have a very special liturgical responsibility. Um, the king is the head of the congregation. So he leads the congregation in prayer and praise. Let's go to this picture again. You get the two courts of the temple. You get the steps here. You have the temple itself, the altar here. You got the Levitical choir here. Now, at the right hand side here, on top of the steps, there was a small little platform, a post, where only one person could stand. Guess whose position that was? The king. That was the king's post, the king's position. He wasn't there every day, he couldn't be there every day, but when he was present at the temple, he stood there 
Can you see what he's connected with? The right hand side of well, God's presence of the Right, oh, he's on the right hand side here of God. Who is he associated with? The Levitical choir. The Levitical choir. And he stands at the head of the assembly. assembly. Well, why isn't he be associated with the Levitical choir? Why is he? Yeah. We'll find it because he instituted it. And uh, we want to look at two passages now. Well, with David, it makes a lot of sense because he yeah, with David, sing and play the harp. Okay. But he didn't actually do it in worship. Who did the singing? Who did the playing? Who did they do it for? The king. The king. So the king establishes the choir to perform his praises. Do you get the basic thing? And who does David sing praises on behalf of? The people. And the people do it on behalf of the nations. So the choir, is, if you like, represents, stands in for David. Let's have a look at two passages where you uh, get this. And the translations don't always make it perfectly clear. First Chronicles chapter 16, 17, 7 to 9. Who's next? I think Stephen, you're next. That day David first committed to Asaph and his associates this psalm of thanks to the Lord. Now, uh, the term therefore first is... Um, as head. Now the term can mean first, but it most likely means that David as head of the congregation, as the head of the nation, gives this psalm of praise to the Levitical singers. So David acts as head of the congregation and he gives his own psalm to the choir to sing. Now it's even more remarkable when you go to 2 Chronicles chapter 7 verse 8. Here we have a case of the Kleinic principle uh, which needs to be observed. Uh, does anybody have a translation of the Bible that's not NIV? Okay, you've got a very literal one there. Can you read yours please? F 2 Chronicles 7 verse 6. And look for the unexplained. Seven, Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 6. Okay. And the priests attended to their offices, and Levites also with instruments of music of the Lord, which David the king had made to praise the Lord, because his mercy endures forever. When David praised by their ministry, and the priests sounded trumpets before them... And okay, the when David praised by their ministry... Or by the hand through them. Now what's interesting here, this is, David's no longer alive. Mm. Even after David's dead, how does David offer praises to God? Through the ministry of the people he appointed. And who are they? The Levitical choir. The Levitical choir. They use his instruments, they use his psalms to praise God. So even when David's dead, David continues to praise God. How does he continue to praise God? Through music. Through his legacy. Through, the through his legacy, through the choir that he established um, as his uh, agents to perform praise, through his instruments and through his psalms. So David, through the Levitical singers, through the instruments that he gave to them, through the psalms that he gave to them, he continues to praise God. So and it's still, if you like, to the present day, how does David still praise God? When we, read the Psalms. Psalms. When we Psalms. sing the Psalms in chapel, David is there praising God. And the, time, sorry? He's going to be praising. He's going to be praising at some time to come because he points forward to somebody else who leads us now. Now the problem is David's no longer alive. But this is appointed to who leads us now in our praises of God and sings the Psalms, leads us in singing the Psalms, praying the Psalms. Jesus. Jesus is not, 
He's not just an intercessor on our behalf, but he's also a praise singer on our behalf. He leads us in our prayers and our praises. So, David performs the Lord's song on behalf of Israel and the nations through the Levitical choir. Okay, now what's the purpose of First and Second uh, Chronicles? First of all, it's to legitimize the musical performance of praise as part of the divine service <laughs> in the Second Temple in the post-exilic period. Now, um, what becomes more and more important as Israel goes on, praise which was oh, began at the time of David and Solomon, becomes more and more important until it became very, very important at the time of Jesus. So praise, the, the importance of praise grows in that post-exilic period. Secondly, it shows how the prosperity of Israel depended on the orthodoxy of her worship according to the law of Moses. Um, Israel prospers not when it has a king or uh, the land or a political system or a good economic system. Israel prophets prospers when they worship God as God gives them to worship in the law of Moses. Lastly, most importantly, First and Second Chronicles defines the nature and identity of Israel as a liturgical community instituted by the Lord through Moses and established by David and Solomon. So in the post-exilic period, um, uh, what counts is the temple and its services. The temple which Solomon built, the services which David then um, made sure were conducted at this location, at the altar in Jerusalem. Okay, now, Old Testament. At this point, we finish. We're three-quarter of the way through the course. Now, any questions? Tony, you have a, your hand up. Yeah, something I've been struggling with for some time. The role of divine service in the Old Testament. Yes. What, I suppose, what is meant by that? It's a big subject. Right? It's a big subject, but if you want to go and see it in a nutshell, go to the end of Exodus chapter 29. Uh, 32 following, or most simply at the end of Exodus chapter 20. Um, and I think we best look there, that's the simplest one. Go to Exodus chapter 20, verse 22 through to 24. Tony, could you read? Exodus 20, 22 to 24. Then the Lord said to Moses, Tell the Israelites this, You have seen for yourself that I have chosen, chosen to you... Not, not chosen, I've spoken. spoken. I have spoken to you from heaven. Do not make any gods to be alongside of me. Do not make for yourselves gods of silver or gods of gold. Make an altar of the earth for me and sacrifice on it your burnt offerings and fellowship offerings, your sheep and goats and your cattle. Wherever I cause my name to be honoured, I will come to you and bless you. No idols, altar, sacrifices. What's the importance of them bringing sacrifices to God? They're blessing. Because wherever God chooses the place for his altar to present offerings, there God will come and bless them. So what's the function of the divine service? So that God can come with and meet with his people in order to do what? To reside with them, they bless them. Yeah, to, to join with them, to meet with them, and to bless them. Mm -hmm. um, now, Exodus 29 says God comes and meets with his people every morning, every evening during the divine service in order to speak to them, to make them holy, uh, he meets with them there, he, may, uh, he uh, acts as their God, and he dwells with them. But all that's summarized up in one verse, word here, blessing. What is the point of the divine service? And the whole of Chronicles basically assumes this. God comes and meets with his people at the temple every morning, every evening, in order to deliver what? Blessing. Blessing. 
an effort, it's an on honouring too, isn't it? Yeah. Of course, it's, it's honouring, but that's secondary. What's important is not what the people do, but what, what God, does. God does through what they do. Yeah. Uh -huh. And so, if how, um, what happens if the people don't perform the divine service? What happens if they shut down the temple, close down the altar, no longer offer the morning and evening sacrifice? And that happened at several times in uh, Jewish history. They're no longer receiving God's blessing. They're no longer receiving God's blessing. It's as simple as that. Well, you're living in my land, and since you don't want to yeah. my blessing, you don't receive my land. That's right, and eventually if it continues, then they not only lose the blessing, but they lose God's land because they've rejected the owner of the land. Remember, that's the theology of Deuteronomy. Yeah. Um, but it's not very complicated, Tony. Any other questions before we leave the Old Testament? Now, okay, a momentous occasion.